Hi, I'm Paula Cherie, and today I'm with Ashton Rodenizer of the Mind's Eye Creative. Welcome, Ashton. It's lovely to have you. Can you tell me a little bit more about you and what you do and how you got started? Yeah, so nice to be here, Paula. Such a, such a joy to spend this day with you today. Yeah, so I am a professional live illustrator. Also could be called a sketch noter or a graphic recorder or a graphic facilitator. And I found this world actually as a facilitator. I had been working at a family a nonprofit center, working with young families. And I got a job there a few years in as a facilitator, and I completely fell in love with the world of facilitation. And it led me to find this term graphic facilitation. And at the time, I had no idea what that was. And I just started doing some research. I took like a day course, and I totally fell in love and kind of left the world of facilitation behind about 10 years ago and went 100% all in in this world. So that's the short version of my life. So you've history. been at this a really long time. And I never thought about, you know, f facilitation like that either. That's completely new to me. Because so I looked over your website and I thought, oh, that's so interesting. So I saw that you like, basically you kind of go in where people have presentations and you can do these graphics and sort of make the presentation like a little bit more lively and easier to understand. Is that... I don't know, was, would that be like a good definition? For yeah, no, that, that's a great summary of it for sure. I do a lot of conference work. I do a lot of conferences. So, you know, there's 10 speakers and as those speakers are talking, like each one, I'm live drawing as they're talking. And basically my job is to try to also keep up. So when people are hearing what is being said, they're looking at my either screen or if I'm in person, they're looking at my giant board and it's reaffirming what they're hearing to deepen that learning, make it a little, like he's a little bit more lively. And yeah, that's sort of the main world when I'm doing conference work. And then there is the facilitation side of it too, where it might be more of like a boardroom meeting, a strategic planning session where there's a whole bunch of voices in a room. And I'm trying to make sure that all voices are, you know, people feel heard, people feel valued, validated, and that it was a good use of their time to be there. It can be as an, like an accountability tool. So I still love working in some facilitation type settings when I can use it to try to help elevate all the voices in the room. So very, very similar skill set. Just those are sort of the primary two use cases that I, I use them in. Okay. So I don't know that I've ever worked with like a facilitator in that manner. I wonder, like, do you help like people stay on topic and not veer off topic? <laughs> Yeah, well, usually when I'm in these situations, I'm wearing my graphic facilitator hat. So I'm really trying to visualize that meeting and would work alongside a facilitator, especially some facilitators that I have a good relationship with and I work kind of ongoing. We have a bit of a song and dance, you know, so when she needs to check in with me, we have a, you know, unspoken language. So, but really it's the facilitator's job to make sure that people kind of stay on time and stay focused and see what's going on. But I am also kind of like the little bit of a back, like a backup timekeeper, because I'll also be kind of keeping a, attention to the flow and the agenda. Sometimes I'll be invited to be a part of the process in the beginning. And I can actually, you know, lean in on my experience as a graphic facilitator, but also my past as a facilitator to help organize the meeting and create agendas and create flows to making sure that like what I'm also doing is going to be very valuable to the room. But that's not always the case. Sometimes people are like, oh yeah, we should invite those that person that does that drawing thing. And then I get a call, you know, two weeks before the event and I just show up. But, you know, it's nice to be a part of the process ahead of time, but I certainly get lots of last minute phone calls for sure. Good. So what other services do you provide it's mostly that what I do with a bit of a twist. So I really see myself as a visual communicator too. So basically taking any sort of information and trying to make it more easy to understand from a visual perspective. So I don't promote it a whole lot, but I certainly do have clients that I do like blog posts for and podcasts and webinars and like different types of 
things. Like I've, I've done some book proposals, like just sort of pre PowerPoint presentations, just really kind of interesting and off the wall things, basically where you're trying to like make, especially a complex idea more easy to understand through a visual way. So yeah, so it's kind of, I've done lots of little different types of opportunities too, but the live illustration piece of it is still sort of my main, my main it's work. It's like your bread and butter. Yeah. I like how you described it. It was like a visual communicator. Um, mm -hmm. That's a great way to, to characterize it. So I noticed, and I was kind of looking over your, your website and stuff, what's the difference between graphic recording and graphic facilitation, or is there a difference? Yeah, I guess I sort of spoke to, but I didn't like, I should have been more specific on the terms, but graphic recording is more, I call it like, that's my conference work. That's like fly on the wall. I'm, I'm kind of the third party of listener and I don't have a voice in the room necessarily. Whereas the graphic facilitation was more the pieces where I'm like, I would team up with a facilitator and I would help create the agenda potentially. And I'm in the room and it's, yeah, I might have a voice. I still might not, but like, it's a different process a little bit when I'm cap like the difference between capturing a presentation. That's like, okay, here's 30 minutes. This is the keywords messages that they were trying to get across. And then like, that's a very specific output. Whereas graphic facilitation is like, can be very more fluid. Like you don't like, it's all conversation based. It is most likely a facilitated discussion. So it's walking through people, like walking people through a process and to facilitate means to make easy. So that's the way I look at it is I'm going to graphic facilitating. I'm making it more easy for them to get to the goal that they're trying to reach. So essentially it's visual communication made easy. Gotcha. There you go. <laughs> Here's my new tagline. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think that really makes it easy for people to understand what you do. Cause I know when you, as soon as you said facilitator, I'm like, I don't know, I'm an artist. <laughs> like, I don't know what that means, but right. the way that I look at, like, there's the world yeah. of teacher teaching, right. And a teacher stands, stands at the room and they know all the answers, right? Like you're learning from them. Facilitator is almost the opposite. You don't know anything. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm sure you actually know things, but you're more of a professional navigator of conversation. Okay. Prof professional facilitators are really good at asking, knowing what questions to ask, like in the moment, right? They go in with a plan. The plan could change. You got to be flexible, right? You know what, you know, at the end of that two day strategic planning session, you know what you're trying to get to, you know, the conversations you wanted to have, the asking the hard questions, navigating people through complexity, Sometimes like it's very uncomfortable, right? Because sometimes you got to unearth nasty stuff, <laughs> like, you know, being good with those kinds of things. So it's about being a professional when it comes to process and making sure that people get what they need and pulling out the wisdom that they already have and just allowing them to see it rather than a teacher is like, no, no, I know everything <laughs> or I know lots of stuff. You're going to learn from me is a totally different process. So at one point I thought maybe I wanted to be a teacher and then I learned about facilitation and I just totally like love that process because it's really about the wisdom that's already in the room. As a facilitator, you don't actually, like you can know things about maybe the topic, you kind of have some meetings and they, everybody can get you up to speed on that specific industry, but you can kind of work in many different areas because it's about having the process. So I love it when facilitators bring me in to support them because then I'm helping elevate the work so that it's just not talk, talk, talk all day long, right? They have this large visual representation of what they just said, right? Okay, gotcha. So what techniques do you use to make the graphics like more easy to understand or easily understandable? Yeah, so the way I look at it is like I have a, it also you could kind of look at it as like an interpretation Right. So just like a interpreter, like a spoken interpreter would stand at the front of the room and interpret either with their hand. I, I was, I almost was a sign language interpreter. So I always go to hands first. They might go with their hands or they might speak a different language. So they, they are translating in real time. Right. So I'm doing the same thing, but in graphics. So I'm trying to take, it's like, you're listening to everything. You're basically also a professional listener because you're listening to absolutely everything. You can't let your mind wander at all, which is really hard to do. <laughs> it's very exhausting. 
And then you have to filter through, synthesize what you're hearing. Try not to have your bias in there because everybody has bias, right? So you're filtering it all out and then you're making those decisions. Okay, I'm going to capture this in words. I'm going to capture this in pictures. I'm going to capture this visual metaphor that puts the two of them together and it's all in the moment. But like I said, I've been doing this for 10 years now. So I have like a bank of images and metaphors and words and and typography and all of this stuff in my brain. So when I hear things, I'm like, okay, I know how to draw this dude to do. I know how to draw this. I know how to, vi- I, oh yeah, I visualized this before this way. Let's do it this way. You know, so you have to make a million decisions within that time frame of how you're, what you're going to filter out for information and, and all of that good stuff. So a keynote presentation, that's how it's different rather because they have their like key points, hopefully, of what they're supposed to say. Whereas facilitation, it can, the, the graphics sometimes can be a little bit more messy, right? Because conversations are messy and and the, the keynote presentation, it might be more of a polished graphic, it might have, be a little bit more clean per se. So yeah, I do this virtually, right? So I would be sharing my drawing screen and drawing on, on my screen. But before the pandemic, I was 100% in person. So I would literally just be carrying around like fo- four foot rolls of paper and wherever I went with my big professional markers and be doing it life size in, in the room. So do you have like a preference? I mean, has it sounds like the pandemic basically changed the way you do business. Like, do you do a lot of illustrations via Zoom now? It totally changed my whole business model. And it actually actually was a good thing because I was trying to figure out how to travel less. Like I got three small kids. It's just like a lot. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to figure out how could I do a little bit more. So it was, I was kind of like a be careful what you wish for <laughs> situation. <laughs> When the pandemic hit, I was like, oh yeah, now I have to figure this out. I was, I didn't have to figure it out right away. And then when that happened, I was like, oh yeah, I have to figure this out now. I still do a lot in, a lot virtually. I have some clients that I work with ongoing and, and they still want me to do everything virtually, which is great. There's pros and cons to both. Yeah, I would imagine so. You know, virtually mm-hmm. I can kind of be comfy. I can get still get my kids off the bus. I could just like work in my pajamas. I can be comfy. I can go get my cup of tea whenever I need to. But in person, it's you can't beat being in person to feed like the energetic feel and right. thing that you, you get from people. It's so energizing. Where at home in doing it virtually is a little is like less energizing the feedback is all virtual, right? You're just still here like by yourself. But when you're in person, you get that immediate feedback. You can, you know, it's just that level engagement is totally different. So there's certainly lots of pros and cons to both sides. And I still do really love being in person, even though I have still, I don't want to say mainly because I've been doing a lot of in-person stuff recently. But it, yeah, there's definitely pros and cons to both. Yeah. But I, I, I do, I love each one for their own way in their own way. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. There was something else I forgot. I was going to ask and I forgot, but it'll come to me. <laughs> so anyway, what advice do you have for, for people that maybe have similar talents and would want to take their creative skills and make a business out of it? Like, I don't know if it's just general advice or something more specific to being an illustrator. Yeah, I guess I'll back up and and I'll, I left out, I feel like I left out a very important part of my story in the beginning was I am not, I, I always and still struggle to call myself an artist. I have never had any formal art training, not an art class, no art school, nothing. <laughs> And I feel like I finally have come to this point, like, yeah, I am an artist, right? Like that's how people like to relate to me because they, it's like, they don't know what else to do with me when they, when I try to explain this is what I do, they're like confused. I'm like, you know, my kid's like, oh, my mom's an artist. They just tell everybody that I'm an artist and they can do it without whatever they want. So I think, and, and I, like I said, I didn't, I didn't like sharing that part of my story from the first few years, for sure, because I felt, well, no one's going to hire me. No one's going to take me seriously if they find out that I don't like, I've never had any art training. I, I came into this world as a facilitator. Now to back up, I have always been very creative. 
Like, I think I've tried every medium at this point. And now I'm learning how to play the ukulele and the bagpipes. Like, I've tried everything, I feel, at this point in many creative, like, ways. I painted and did lots of things, but I didn't actually draw a whole lot. So it was a skill set I had to develop as I was learning how to also try to communicate visually. So I was sort of teaching myself how to draw stuff while also trying to figure out, could I create a business and do, and like charge people money to do this kind of thing? So it, I guess if you're out there and you're like, well, I never took an art class or I don't, you know, I just watched YouTube videos or whatever, like the, I was in that boat for sure. And it is totally possible to make a living off of being an artist without having any formal art background or, you know, if you're self-taught, like, I think that's great, you know, so, and I, I'm sort of switching a little bit now into being more of an educator of teaching people how to do this for themselves, like take their own visual notes. So I sort of lean into that experience in my background a little bit more than I used to, because I'm like, you can learn how to take your own visual notes. Like I did not know how to draw anything when I started. So like, it's totally possible for you to do too. Whereas it might not be as relatable if I'm like, well, I have a you know, masters in art history or art, whatever, I don't know, something, then it might not be as relatable because they, they might not believe me as much. Like you can totally draw stuff. <laughs> you can create beautiful sketch notes or visual no notes, right? Without having a lot of, without considering yourself to even be creative. And, you know, I just try to tease out that everybody's creative, but anyways, that's my long tangent about that. I don't even know if I answered your whole question, but you did. So I started out kind of the same way in that I did not go to formal, you know, I didn't take formal photography classes. It's real life experience. It's getting out there and doing it. And we don't need, you know, to attach a whole bunch of emotions behind a title. You know, you're not any less of an artist because you didn't take any formal classes. As I said, you have real life experience. If anything, I feel like that's more valuable. And I've been working as a photographer now for... 13 years. And I started out the same way. I had a corporate job and I did the same thing. I did it part-time for a long time while I tried to figure out how to make a business out of it. Right. So I think you're more than qualified to help other professionals learn how to do this for themselves. I am also a business coach. I like to help other creatives, you know, help them in their business as well. So you absolutely did answer my question. And I think <laughs> The takeaway is that, you know, don't get too caught up about, you know, feeling like, like imposter syndrome, like you're not good enough, like you don't deserve the title or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, one thing I didn't, going back to the question that I forgot that I was going to ask. So when you do like, like what sorts of businesses utilize your services? Like what kind of, I guess, what genres, what industries? Yeah, it's a good question because, you know, in, in business world, as you may know, everyone talks about the niche, right? Everything, you have to have a niche. You have to have a business avatar. You need to have all these things. Mm -hmm. And I don't really have a niche. <laughs> I don't really have a business avatar because I can work in any field. I feel like if there's a field, you know, if you think of a field, I've probably worked in it at this point. I... Back in 2017, when I was really like, okay, I'm going to like actually make a business. I had been dabbling for a couple of years, trying to figure it out. I had my, my second child was, had just turned one and I was like, okay, like I'm going to try to figure that, like actually build a business and not have secret business, right? Business you actually tell people that you actually have a business, right? So I started, I landed my first tech conference in the spring of 2017 and that completely snowballed from there i just leveraged that one tech conference then did another and did another and did another and did another and you know ended up on stage with steve wozniak you know in front of 2000 people mm -hmm. right so like it just sort of snowballed from there and i leaned in on the the experience that i had so every time i would do an education i'd be like okay what other education events are out there what other folks are out there because then i had started building up a portfolio. I have a bit of a reputation in cybersecurity. I do a lot in cybersecurity. 
but I'm not definitely not limited to basically any, any industry because I basically, my client is trying to break down complexity, make things engaging, make information, you know, elevated, make sure people feel valued. So, and that's, it could be in any industry. <laughs> so I've certainly leaned, I still do a lot in technology, a lot, and I really love them and they're great, but I'm definitely not limited to just that, that world for sure. Yeah. So basically I say, anybody who's got money, they're my client. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true though. I mean, niching down does make it easier to market from a marketing standpoint, but there's no reason why, like if you were advertising your business, why you couldn't make an ad specific to cybersecurity or I don't know, what's another complex issue, like healthcare, you know, yeah. things like that, Definitely. more complex subject matters, I guess, that, that needs or could benefit from illustration. So what do you do to keep your skills fresh? I... I don't do as much as I should because I am really busy with client work, which is great, but I have, I, I try to draw and like, I'm always trying to build up my visual vocabulary, especially when it is a newer industry, an industry I don't have as much experience in. I'm like, how do I draw DNA a few different ways so that I'm not just drawing it the same way every time? So it's... Yeah, I, I just try to draw like, and it's fun because now my kids are getting a little older now and they like to draw. So they, we just sort of have draw jams together and, you know, get, get out my big paper and my, they're like, well, they want these mom's markers, which I'm very <laughs> protective of. <laughs> they want to use mom's fancy markers and we, we draw together, which is really fun. And yeah, that, and, and like I said, I am, I am sort of going into more of the education space right now, teaching people how to do this. So that right now is extra fresh because I, I am, I feel like my skills are being, I don't say challenged, but I'm learning a lot from those people. And then I, I'm practicing things that I'm also learning from them. Which right. Is you're, diverse, you're diversifying your skill set. You know, and I love the draw jams. It's kind of informal, but it's definitely like there's an element of fun fun there, which keeps things fresh also. Oh yeah. It has to be fun. And I like to think like at the end of the day, I think a lot of clients, sometimes they'll hire me because they think I'm, I don't like to think myself as the entertainment, but sometimes they just want that cool drawing thing. But then once I start working with them, I can speak to some of the actual, like the actual value that they're getting from it. Right. Like people are going to feel heard. People are going to have, like, it's engaging. Like you know, people who maybe can't sit physically in front of their computer on a virtual conference all day, now they won't miss out on the information and make, make it more accessible, right? Have those opportunities to talk about the extra value pieces. And like for anyone who's out there is like kind of in the new stages too, like, you know, if you stick with it, you will get to a point where your work, you believe in your work and what you're doing and what you're creating so much that you do feel like people will miss out if they don't work with you in some way, either if you are have like a creative business mind, mind which is a little bit more service based, or if you are creating something like more of a product in a way, you know, people will miss out by not hiring Paula because like she's the best photographer in town and you can be like, I know I'm great and people are going to miss out. Like your price is your price. And then if people, mm -hmm. if they want to work with you, like, you know, that you could be elevating their brand or their identity or whatever it is that you're helping them with and that they're going to be missing out and, and you can look at it in that way. But that comes with time and experience. Like those first few rejections and I, get rejected still like daily, you know, you'll get through, like there is on the other side of all of the rejection. You're, you do get a, like a little rejection proof because it, it won't hurt so much. Like I'll promise you this. It won't hurt. It won't hurt so much when, if you stick with it, but there's that, that those first few years, I think can be really hard, especially as, as a creative, because you know, there's still a lot of like starving artist mentality and all of that stuff. And we as people still like highly undervalue our work. Right. And we always feel like, you know, one thing that I love talking with other creatives about is money because it's still such a taboo subject. Nobody wants to talk about it. I love talking about money because, 
you know, I, I get so frustrated when people are like, well, you know, I just want to, I just want to, you know, I don't want to charge. And I'm like, no, you deserve a vacation. To me, if you can't afford a vacation, then you're not charging enough, right? Like you deserve to have- well, I mean, We have to pay our bills. We can't pay our bills with exposure. Exactly. You can't pay your bills and you can't go on a vacation. Like think beyond just paying your bills. You deserve to go on a flipping vacation. <laughs> Right. And, and I always think it's an energy exchange out. as well, you know? Exactly. Yeah, it is an energy exchange. And if you're expelling your energy and then, then you're just going to be giving and giving all of your energy and you won't have any energy left for yourself. And I know for me, I'm kind of in it so much every day now constantly that I don't have a lot of creative energy for myself at the end of the day. So that's something I'm going through personally is like, what does my creative energy look like for myself? Because I, all the art up until I did this work was mainly just creating just for creating sake. And I haven't had that in my life for years now. You know, that's why I'm like learning how to play the bagpipes and ukulele do all these things because it's just for fun, just for me. And I'm doing it with my kids too, of course, but you know, like I need creative energy for myself. So like, you can't be just giving all of your creative energy, especially if you're not having some sort of exchange back, right? You can't just expending it for right. everybody else and then either not getting compensated or not doing some sort of exchange. And then you have no creative energy left or you like, you got no money and you got no creative energy left. And then you're totally empty. Right. And that leads to burnout, which is why so many creative entrepreneurs end up giving up a lot of times. So you have to charge enough so you can take on fewer clients and really service the clients that you do have, you know, give them excellent service. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, work creates more work, right? Like I don't really right. have to market myself, right? Like the last sort of couple of years, even through the pan, like I made it through the pandemic. Okay. Because I, I just hit the ground. I was like, all right, all of, all of my clients that I've worked with usually in person, like, what do you got going on? What can I help you with? And you know, every time I show up at an event, people go, oh my goodness, will you work at my event that's happening in three months or whatever? So, you know, if you show up and you're, you can like that exchange is fair and is fulfilling for you too, then, you know, you can over time, let the reins off a little bit because you'll just be self-fulfilling, fulfilling machine, right? When people experience your work or they buy one of your things and people see it and they're like, you know, that will just be gate more work, but you can't be that if you're not getting compensated well for it. Right. Exactly. I call it my resentment level. If I'm doing a job and I'm feeling a little resentful, then I know I didn't charge enough. And then next time, you know, you don't have to shame yourself. You're like, okay, now I know better. Now, next time I gotta, you know, and I've just inched like over 10 years. I've just inched. And one thing I think I was really good in the beginning, I, I started charging right off the bat. Like even when I was like, didn't know anything, <laughs> I started charging right off the bat. And I was working with a facilitator and he was like, oh, you should charge the same much as much as me. And I'm like, no, I can't. Like it, I, I charge like a quarter of him because I was, I couldn't even imagine charging what he was charging. And I just inched, it's just inched it over time, over time, every year, just just dial it up, dial it up over time. Right. And you, you hit those resentment levels and you know, you got to inch it. You got to stretch a little bit more. And then, you know, people hire me sometimes because like, I just had someone back a couple weeks ago. They're like, I want, I want you because you know what you're doing and I don't have to babysit you. I know you're going to show up and you'll just do it. And I'm like, yeah, I will. Like I'm a well oiled machine at this point. I can show up and do it, <laughs> you know? So people will pay for quality. You know, you do not have to be the lowest price around, you know, like don't compare your prices to other people's prices because they have their own money beliefs, their own belief around, you know, what, what they should or could charge and, and their own influences. So as much as you can try, like, just try not to ask other people in your industry what they're charging. I think my opinion, because like, you might know, like, I know industry, like I know the range in my industry across the world of what people are charging. And it's very extreme, <laughs> like the extreme, like, you know what I mean? So I know generally things, but at the end of the day, you have to do what is right for you. What's going to work for you. 
Agreed. You know, and it's, it, you're so right because price is always a race to the bottom, but you're, somebody else's expenses are going to be totally different than exactly. yours. Their experience level is likely to be different. Even, even if you have the same skill sets and the same experience, they're not going to have the same eye. It's just like hiring a photographer. Like there's a bunch yeah. of us out here. You can hire somebody else, but their work is never going to look like mine and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're paying for my time expertise, you know, and my creative eye, my style. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with you. I think that's with any creative industry. And I think that's one of the things that creatives definitely struggle with when they price themselves is because they're not realizing that you are not a commodity. You are an artist. Your vision is unique. So, you know, your pricing should reflect, you know, your expenses, your time, your experience, all of those things. And they're always going to be, you know, different than another artist. But I think that's great advice is to not base your pricing upon what another artist charges in your industry. Yeah. Cause you know, you don't want to get into a place where you're second guessing yourself. You know, you really want to feel grounded. And in the beginning I was trying to get comfortable with my pricing and I just was talking to other entrepreneurs who were not in my industry and I shouldn't have done that because they were like, Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh, like how could you charge that much? Blah, blah, blah. And it was really defeating. It was really defeating. And I'm like, why am I asking people in my industry who aren't, sorry, who are not in my industry, what I should be charging or telling them. They don't know anything about my industry. It'd be like me saying, oh, Polly, you should charge X as a photographer. Like, I have no idea. Like, why would I, like, and why would you want to listen to what I had to say? <laughs> Even though also I'm a creative, like, I don't know anything about the photography industry and what pricing is, whatever. Like, I don't know. You know, so I think it, it can just be like, a, yeah, you can get into that very easily, like race to the bottom for sure. And, and get in a space where you start second guessing it. And, you know, we like I have most books that I read are around business and money. A lot of like I read, mm -hmm. I spent like years. That's all I read was money books, money books, money books. And, you know, because I had to rewrite beliefs around what I believe I could charge what I believe I can make, what, what my time is worth, what is value, like all of this stuff, like having to completely rewire my brain to, you know, not just believe that I could make money, but that I could have it in my bank account, that I could go on a vacation, that I could take some time off or that, which I'm very bad at. <laughs> I am very bad at taking time off, but I could, I could. I think a lot of us are. <laughs> it's horrible, but you know, like there's, you know, I'm always learning, I'm always growing. And a lot of the energy is around like, you know, learning di different business things. But I feel like I'm a bit of an oddball when it comes to building a business too, because I really lean into my intuition. That's how I make decisions. You know, I lean into experimentation. I treat everything like an experiment, you know, so nothing, you can't really feel at anything if everything's just an experiment. And, you know, like they, if you look at, if you look at it in that way, then it's fun. Right. And if you're an intuitive person and you, you know, like listen to your gut, make this, like, I have had situations where I'll be like, I just randomly thought of someone and I'm like, I should email them. I, I haven't talked to them in a year. I should email them. Apparently my, my body and my brain and my heart is like, reach out to this person. And then they're like, Oh, I was just thinking of you. Like that's the, like, you can run a successful business while also lit, like, you know, take Paula's advice. I'm sure she's got some good stuff. <laughs> you can also listen to your intuition. Yeah. I'm not sure if you talk about that with your clients and stuff, but you know, like it doesn't have to be like, I'm a process. I'm a spreadsheet girl too. Like, don't get me wrong. I like, I like my numbers. I like my spreadsheets. <laughs> I, I definitely feel like I'm this really weird blend of like, you know, hippie, creative, like all my kids have plant names, you know, like this world. And then this like business world is like really weird mesh. In I think I am too, though. I always say like, I used to, you know, say I'm a business person, person, an artist second, but I think I'm both honestly. And I don't think one is secondary to the other anymore, but I used to say that all the time. And I think it, it just resonates with that idea. Yeah. I just um, I call, they call, my friends call it my hippie scale. Like, I'm just like, 
They're like, no, you just turned into like super business mode or like, whoa, you're like in hippie mode right now. It's like, you know, you and you have to have that fluidity like of, of falling along the scale because you can't just be completely business all the time, right? Because as an artist, you got to connect to your body and heart and your mind, all that, you know, all that good stuff. And then you can't just be in in only artist mode without having any business like it has you have to be able to slide that scale and have the skills right have the business skills but then also have like lean into you know the creative side of you and listen to your intuition and do all of those things right so i always just feel like i'm constantly sliding back and forth on the scale because you still got to have contracts you still got to send your invoices <laughs> And you gotta be, and you gotta show up and have this creative energy and, and expelling that for, for your clients, right? So do you have any like current projects that you wanna let our audience know about? Or just, if not, then you can tell people where to find you online. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, this is a really interesting timing because I have a book coming out like, oh, like, wow. this, like oh. this week, like this week, next week, I'm not sure the exact day yet. But, you know, by the time this airs, I'm sure it will be available. So I, I wrote the beginner's guide to sketchnoting. So if anyone is interested in learning how to draw their own notes, take their own visual notes, they can certainly go and pick up a physical copy or an ebook version of that. And I really felt like there's some good sketchnoting books, not a lot of them, but there's some good ones out there. But I felt like there was a beginner, like, I felt like what was missing was a beginner's guide, especially for people who, you know, it would be great for kids, you know, in school still that, you know, want to take notes visually instead of just this like very archaic way that we've learned how to take notes, which is very like linear and boring. <laughs> so that, you know, good for them. But then also good for like folks that attend a lot of meetings, attend a lot of conferences and want to or like to take notes or want to get back into note taking, but don't want to go back to the way that we used to and, and drawing, you know, it, you know, that whole concept around using drawing as a thinking tool, right? Using drawing and the creative expression to help you learn deeper, to connect with information, to try to help break down complexity. And yeah, I just felt like there was a gap around a beginner's guide, a really like handhold, like we start talking about lines, like just draw a line then point at, put a little arrow and now it's an arrow and now you can make a box and this is how we listen and this is how we capture. So it's, it's a very handhold guide and I spent a year and a half writing it. I did, I did a baiting, beta, beta reading and I had like 1500 comments to sift through, through my three rounds of beta reading. So I feel really good that I took the time to get feedback from people. So I knew what was missing, you know, some things that I felt like were common sense were not, you know, I had missed whole chunks that were really important that I had to add in. And it's not a very long book. It has lots of drawings in it, but it's really like that sort of beginner. Like I would like to think at like at the end of two or three hours, like you could create your own sketch note, like you could create one for sure. Cool. I feel yeah, I feel pretty confident about saying that. I hope so. <laughs> Is it going to be available on Amazon or yeah, can you well, pick up yeah. a copy on your website? Yeah, so I also I have a new website, sketchnote.school. So folks can go there and grab a copy of it. And I also have like a free weekly newsletter that goes out on Saturdays called Sketchnote Saturdays, where I pull a lesson or learning or something and give a tip or trick on how to improve your sketchnoting habits. So if anyone wants to join that, that newsletter too. So those are sort of the main, and I have a community as well that I just launched in April and it's been really, really fun in there and learning from everybody. And I do workshops in there and we do doodle of the week and it's really fun. Awesome. Well, so it sounds like your teaching career on this, uh, on this end is really beginning to take off. I wish you the best and I really Appreciate you taking the time out to speak with me today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Paula. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.